Thank you all. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the George W. Bush Presidential Center right here on the SMU campus. It, might be, it looks like it's been a little while since some of you were on a university campus. Uh, but anyway, welcome to Dallas. You have come today to discuss a principle that President Bush has always prized, and that's the rule of law, of course. And no one represents President Bush's commitment to the principle than the man you've selected as your keynote speaker today, Justice Sam Alito. We're pleased to welcome the federal appellate district and state court judges here today who also appreciate and grapple with the rule of law on a daily basis. Thank you all for the important role you play and for the service that you give to your nation. As I look around the room this morning, I see many familiar faces and former colleagues, some of them that President mentioned, Michael Chertoff, Michael Mukasey, Harriet Myers, Larry Thompson, Leonard Leo, and many others who helped write the history preserved in these walls. It's a history of great challenges and great achievements. It's a history of an administration committed to expanding the reach of opportunity and freedom. And it's a history of a president willing to make tough decisions needed to advance those principles. Our mission at the Bush Center goes beyond preserving history. We want to prepare a new generation to make history. As we like to put it here, leadership is our core competency. And who better to talk about that than two former leaders? We believe that young leaders here and around the world can learn from studying how former presidents confronted challenges, made choices, and stayed true to the values that made the United States the greatest nation ever known. To prepare a new generation of leaders, we have museum exhibits that recreate the most important decisions President Bush faced. When you go visit the library, and I hope that you will not leave here without doing that, you'll see the agenda that President Bush brought to the office for education and economic reform. You'll see how on a clear day in September, we transformed his presidency into a wartime presidency. You'll see how noble and brave Americans in uniform took the fight to the terrorists abroad, and you'll see a replica of the Oval Office where President Bush made decisions that stemmed a financial crisis, kept the American people safe, and advanced the cause of freedom around the world. To prepare a new generation of leaders, we also have a policy institute, that's where you are now, that promote the principles that have always guided President and Mrs. Bush. We have programs that work for better schools and encourage education reform, promote economic growth, and support men and women willing to risk their lives to stand up for freedom in countries still under tyranny. We have programs that honor men and women wounded in defense of our country. In a week, President Bush will host 25 wounded warriors at the Las Colinas Country Club here in Dallas for the fifth annual Wounded Warrior Open Golf Tournament. In Africa, through our Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon program, we have programs that help women find life-saving medical care for cancer. And across the developing world, we have programs that help women take leadership roles in their countries, a program stewarded by Mrs. Bush. On Tuesday, we will welcome first ladies from around the world, including our current first lady, Mrs. Obama, along with leaders of the public and private sector for the Global Women's Network Summit. We also have a leadership training program that we recently formed in partnership with three other presidential centers in our region. It's called the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program, and our inaugural class of scholars graduated here in July at an event featuring President Bush and President Clinton, who stewarded this leadership program. And we are now accepting applications for our second class. Behind all of these programs is a belief that great challenges require compassionate and courageous leadership. That's the kind of leadership President Bush provided during his eight years in the Oval Office, and it's the kind of leadership we promote around the world today. As you look around today, I ask you to consider getting more involved with our work. Many of you were part of the history of the Bush administration, and now you can be part of the future of the Bush Center. Good luck with your conference today, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President and Secretary Spellings. Uh, that is a hard act to follow. <laughs> 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeremy Cronodal, and on behalf of the Dallas chapter of the Federalist Society, we want to welcome you here today. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, know a lot about the, uh, the lawyers' chapters of the Federalist Society, but if not, we invite you to join us. Uh, in Texas, we have chapters in Austin, Corpus Christi, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Houston. Typically, we meet, uh, each chapter meets once a month and enjoys thought-provoking speakers on a variety of topics. Uh, if you're interested, please come see me or, or one of us during a break, and what, we'd love to get you plugged in. Now, before I get too far, I've been asked uh, to announce to any Twitter user uh, to please tweet about the event using the hashtag FedSockEvents. We have an exciting day ahead, beginning with our first panel entitled War on Terror, and, and so I would invite uh, the first panelists to come up to the stage as we proceed. September 11th, 2001 dramatically changed the focus of the Bush administration, requiring fortitude, wisdom, and calm in responding to a violent attack on our nation. The panelists this morning were intimately involved in forming and carrying out that response while ensuring that, as our Constitution requires, the rule of law survived. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, this morning's panel members. The moderator, John Rizzo. Mr. Rizzo spent 34 years in the Office of General Counsel at the CIA, serving as the Chief Legal Officer there from 2001 to 2009. During that time, Mr. Rizzo provided legal counsel, policy guidance, and leadership on the most difficult and time-sensitive national security issues facing the United States. In 2014, uh, Mr. Rizzo wrote Company Man, a memoir of his career at the CIA. Today, he is senior counsel at Steptoe & Johnson in Washington, D.C. The Honorable Michael Chertoff, Secretary Chertoff, served as Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security from 2005 to 2009. During this period, he also served on the National Security Council, the Homeland Security Council, and the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Mr. Chertoff also served as a federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. He is currently the executive chairman and co-founder of the Chertoff Group and senior of counsel at Covington and Burling in Washington. Next, we have Jim Haynes. Mr. Haynes served as the general counsel of the Department of Defense from 2001 to 2008, a post from which he oversaw some 10,000 lawyers and which has been described as one of the most powerful and influential legal posts in the entire federal government. Following government service, Mr. Haynes joined Chevron Corporation as chief corporate counsel. He is currently the general counsel and executive vice president of Sega Technologies. Next, we have the Honorable Michael Mukasey. Judge Mukasey served as the 81st Attorney General of the United States, the nation's chief law enforcement officer from November 2007 to January 2009. During that time, he oversaw the Department of Justice's, the, the, U, the DOJ, and advised on critical issues of domestic and international law. From 1988 to 2006, Judge Mukasey served as a district judge in the, in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, becoming chief judge in 2000 and overseeing numerous terrorism trials and national security proceedings. Judge Mukasey is currently a partner at Debevoise and Plimpton in New York. And last but not least, uh, Larry Thompson. Mr. Thompson was the Deputy Attorney General of the Department of Justice from 2001 to 2003, during which time uh, the Attorney General at that time, John Ashcroft, named Mr. Thompson to lead the DOJ's National Security Coordination Council. Mr. Thompson previously served as the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia, where he led major political corruption and drug trafficking prosecutions brought by that office. Following government service, Mr. Thompson served as the Executive Vice President of Government Affairs, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for PepsiCo. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's personally, it's uh, it was it is an honor uh, to be uh, on this on this panel with these gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> and to be asked to uh, not only be on the panel but be the moderator. Uh, a task I find uh, both daunting and <coughs> ironic. Uh, Ironic because having a grizzled CIA guy moderate anything is, uh, 
unusual. CIA and moderate usually do not appear in the same sentence. Uh, daunting because of, because of the, uh, the four men uh, uh, seated next to me here. Um, I spent three and a half decades in the intelligence community uh, at CIA. I served under seven presidential administrations, 11 CIA directors. Fun fact, uh, George H.W. Bush was my first uh, boss when I, when I arrived, a naive kid in January of 1976 in Langley. Uh, the building, as many of you know, uh, in 1999 uh, was renamed for uh, President Bush. Uh, uh, he only served uh, as CIA director uh, for one year before the uh, Carter administration arrival. And I think it speaks volume that he had such an impact uh, on the organization, on the people, that close to three decades later, uh, the building uh, was named after him. Uh, the other, uh, well, in particular, uh, these four gentlemen, uh, you know, I met and dealt with probably thousands of senior government officials during, uh, during my uh, long and eventful career. And uh, really, these, these four represent <coughs> to me uh, the most honorable, the most impressive, uh, and the most courageous and effective public servants uh, I ever, I ever uh, associated with. So this is a real uh, privilege. Um, with that, we, uh, you know, in discussing, in discussing how we were going to uh, use the time here, one thing we all immediately agreed on was that we didn't want to spend the entire time just uh, talking to and among uh, ourselves. So I'm going to devote, uh, we're going to devote a good chunk of time, um, last half hour or perhaps longer, for questions and answers and comments. Uh, because that's really uh, what, certainly in my case, makes appearing uh, at the, in uh, speaking appearances the most fun. We will start with um, each, each of us uh, taking a few minutes uh, in, in sort of an overview, uh, describing where we were on the morning of uh, that fateful day, almost exactly 14 years ago, uh, what our roles were, uh, in, at the time, and really, uh, whatever overarching thoughts w uh, uh, each of us have about that about that period uh, in uh, in American history. So, beginning uh, at my far left, physically on the far <laughs> left. Uh, Thank you, John. <laughs> Let me uh, let me uh, turn it over to Larry uh, Thompson to begin. Uh, thank you, John. Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin by just uh, sharing with you the indelible memory that the events of 9-11 left with me. Uh, my boss, John Ashcroft, was out of town giving a speech. I was in the process of meeting with the United States Attorney uh, for Rhode Island, we were discussing a major uh, political corruption investigation um, that was um, about to start in Providence, and uh, I was told that we had experienced a terrorist attack. I received a call from uh, Richard Clark from the National Security Council. Uh, I then received a call from Condi Rice, who told me to stay put. Don't leave the office. And literally within five minutes, a group of United States Marshals came into my office and arrested me. It seemed like they arrested me because I was whisked away uh, driving up on sidewalks because the streets were full of people walking to drive, and I was driven to the undisclosed um, location. So you can see how something like that, you know, leaves really an indelible memory uh, in your mind. I want to commend the Federal Society for sponsoring uh, this event. You know, as long as we uh, remain subject to murder by terrorists, even mass murder by terrorists, and I still think that that's a possibility, uh, we need to have a serious 
discussion about these events. So let me begin by um, talking to you briefly about um, what the Bush administration inherited from the Department of Justice standpoint when we took office. Um, uh, as, it related to the, uh, as it relates to uh, information sharing procedures, and this is something that the Department of Justice was deeply responsible for. And these information sharing procedures basically dictated how FBI agents involved in counterintelligence uh, matters would uh, relate to prosecutors in the Department of Justice. Um, and these um, procedures, I think, Mike, were put in around 19, in the 90s, at some point in time. And this is what we inherited. And um, Mike Chertoff, uh, soon after I was sworn in, in May of 2001, Mike Chertoff uh, came into my office because at that time there was a lot of chatter about uh, something that might happen. None of us expected it to be in the homeland, but there was a lot of chatter about um, something that might be happening. And Mike came into my office and said, these procedures are not working. And he had been told by lawyers in his office uh, and by FBI agents uh, that what we had in place was not sufficient to protect us. In August, uh, after uh, consulting with Mike and other people, in August of 2001, by the way, th these information procedures were called the wall, the so-called wall, that prevented us from connecting the dots. In August of 2001, we issued a memorandum after consulting with Mike and a number of people that in effect lowered the wall. We couldn't unilaterally at that time undo uh, the uh, 1990 procedures that had been put in place by the previous administration, but we had in effect lowered the wall. And of course, uh, we had the attack a month later after that memorandum was issued, and after 9-11, the wall completely came down. <coughs> and I, I, I wanna discuss I wanted to discuss uh, these procedures because put into context of what we have learned and what we haven't learned. And one of the things that we haven't learned in my judgment is that we really haven't really learned from our mistakes. Our existing uh, anti-terrorism policies are really based upon abstract theories. Um, they're based upon um, strident and inflexible principles. We are still not listening to uh, the professionals on the ground, the professionals on the front line, as to what tools they need to have in order to protect us. And I think that if you start from the premise that the threat of terrorism, and this is the premise that I believe, that the threat of terrorism actually represents sort of a state of war, then what we need to do as a country is to make certain that we win. What we need to do is to make certain that our people are protected. In fact, what we need to do is to make certain um, that we're not killed. And um, we haven't done that. And I think it's uh, very important uh, that we have this discussion this morning. Uh, my friend, David Chris, who worked with me in the deputy's office on um, uh, security matters, national security matters, he said he used this um, analogy that if you if the threat is a nail then you need to have a hammer to deal with it if the threat is a bolt then you need to have a wrench but what we can't do is to uh, prescribe a bolt for all kinds of threats so one of the things I think we need to do is to make certain that we listen to the people on the front line who are protecting us make certain that we understand the tools that they need in order to do their jobs. And then we need to understand and make a decision as to what we cannot do. But don't start from the top, but start from the bottom and determine hmm. policy. Um, when I left government, I spoke about some of my experiences as it related to our war on terrorism. And I said that there, based upon, based upon my experience, there are three things that we need to avoid if we're going to be successful in our efforts. Uh, and again, that's why this conference is important, because I think it can address these three concerns. First of all, uh, we need to avoid complacency. Uh, uh, we had complacency as a country 
in 2001 prior to the events of 9-11, and I think complacency is beginning to creep in now. And I think the prospect, as I said earlier, of murder or even mass murder of civilians by terrorists remains in our country. And we need to avoid being ill-informed. And by ill-informed, I mean that we really need to understand what kind of tools do we need uh, to protect ourselves, and then, under, and then understand what kind of compromises do we need to make uh, to put those tools in effect. And finally, I think we need to make certain that we secure public confidence in our procedures um, and what we're doing to protect ourselves. Things like releasing uh, partisan reports of Senate investigations uh, that undermine our national security efforts do not help secure public confidence. And quite frankly, things like the overuse by the FBI of national security letters that Mike and I talked about, that doesn't help um, 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 establish public <clears throat> confidence in our procedures. So these are the um, things that I have observed in thinking about uh, this panel discussion. And I look forward to uh, answering your questions. Thank you, John. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Michael Chertoff. <coughs> uh, John, thank you, and thanks for moderating. Um, uncharacteristically. Uh, and thanks to the Federalist Society for having this conference, which I think is, is very useful as, as we look back. Uh, so I be, was sworn in as the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Criminal Division in June of 2001. This is before the creation of the National Security Division. So the head of the Criminal Division had not only the, the traditional criminal prosecution responsibilities, but also dealt with national security issues uh, as they came up at the Department of Justice. Um, at the time that September 11th occurred, only some of the confirmed positions at the department were populated. And also at that time, of course, there was no Department of Homeland Security. So the responsibility for managing uh, domestic terrorist incidents was part of the domain of the Department of Justice. On September 11th, I was uh, in my car driving in to work. I had my uh, cell phone, which was in those days a clunky thing on the dashboard. Um, I had it on speaker, and I was talking to one of my deputies, and he said, oh, a plane hit the World Trade Center. And probably like a lot of people, I thought some private pilot got turned around and <clears throat> wound up uh, you know, uh, crashing into the uh, building. And he had CNN on, <clears throat> and as we talked, he said a second plane crashed into the World Trade Center. And then we realized that it was an attack. So a few minutes later, I arrived at the, at the Department of Justice, um, and uh, my deputy and I went across the street to the FBI, the Hoover Building, to the Strategic Informa Information and Operations Center, SIOC, which is where the Bureau uh, ran its operations. And when I arrived there, it was swarming with people. Bob Mueller was there. Bob had only been on the job for about eight days <laughs> on September 11th. And I think Tom um, Picard, who was the deputy, was there. And we were trying to uh, figure out what, what's coming next. Um, as I was there, we learned, of course, about the plane uh, crashing into the Pentagon. And then I remember vividly tracking the progress through a number of secure video conferences of the plane, which ultimately came down over Shanksville. Um, I should tell you that actually for a few days, I believe the plane had been shot down. It wasn't until a few days later that I learned actually it was the heroic action of the passengers. Uh, what many people don't realize and don't remember is there were other false alarms on that day. For example, uh, we were on a civets at one point, <clears throat> and the State Department uh, had a fire alarm go off. And the immediate reaction was a bomb in the State Department. There was another plane that was coming in from, I think, overseas from the Pacific that had the transponder go off, and we believed there was another hijacking, and it took a, a, a little bit of time to sort out the fact that it was a mechanical issue and not a, a hijacking. There was a rumor that taxi drivers in Washington had bombs in their uh, automobiles and were going to detonate them in front of public buildings. And the reason I, I emphasize this is because, in retrospect, it always seems obvious what the dimensions of 9-11 were, but at the time, when you're living it in real time, you really don't know what's going to come next. And 
much of what happened in the next days and weeks was about preventing other things from happening in an environment in which we had no reason to believe this was not merely the opening salvo of what could be a, a series of, of attacks. Uh, pretty quickly, we were able to <clears throat> uh, begin to ascertain who actually was responsible for this. Uh, a number of the passengers on the planes that were hijacked did wind up uh, calling loved ones. And it was possible, <clears throat> based on the information that we were starting to collect, <clears throat> to figure out who the hijackers were from their seating assignments. And once we began to learn their identities, it became clear that we were dealing with foreign uh, operatives. In one case, there was, I won't mention the name, but there was a um, senior official at the department um, who I had to call and ask to allow the Bureau to interview because he had lost his wife on the American Airlines plane that crashed into the Pentagon. So this was a very personal thing for everybody there, not just an, an abstract thing. Um, and as we went forward over the next days and weeks, and I spent pretty much 20 hours a day at the Bureau for the next several weeks, um, it was really about, first of all, figuring out who the hijackers were. We, you know, it didn't take long to realize it was Al Qaeda, but then to follow the trail with concentric circles. Who did they get the identification from that they used? How did they pay for things? Who were they dealing with? You know, we found out where they had stayed the night before, and we sent people in with search warrants to search for what we call pocket litter, you know, things that were in the trash that might give information about identities. We were able to get credit card numbers. Um, and we slowly built a kind of a, a giant link chart that enabled us to identify anybody that they had come into contact with. And many of these people were questioned. Uh, a significant number were detained, some on based on uh, criminal charges, you know, sometimes there were credit card fraud or, or immigration fraud, sometimes on material witness warrants, which I know Judge Mukasey will talk a little bit about. Um, and the idea was, uh, you know, given the fluidity of the situation and the fact that you had to assume that hijackers who had been in the country for a period of time had help, it was very important to prevent other things from happening. And, um, you know, moving from a paradigm of let's punish people to let's prevent attacks was a mind shift for the Department of Justice. But after all, you can't really punish a suicide bomber after they've carried out the mission. So if you don't prevent it, you failed. Um, just apropos of the wall, um, so there was a, a rule, because you couldn't use intelligence collection uh, authorities to collect for criminal cases, there was a rule that really prevented the intelligence uh, folks at the Bureau from sharing with the criminal folks uh, as long as they were going to continue to use intelligence methods. And um, I vividly remember a couple of days later, I don't know if Larry remembers this, um, I, they, the judge in, who was in charge of the FISA court, you know, let us bring the wall down. And I was looking at some of the intelligence files, and <clears throat> I come to find, as I'm looking at one file, there's a guy named Masawi who was um, picked up on an immigration issue. Turned out he'd been taking flying lessons in Oklahoma. He'd been taking like some kind of karate lessons. And as I read through the file, it became evident that he fit the profile of a hijacker. And it wasn't only evident to me, uh, it was pretty clear to the agent who was investigating uh, this guy. I think he was up in Minnesota. And at one point, the agent wanted to get a search warrant and couldn't get it under the existing authorities because he wanted to see what was in the guy's laptop. And in the memo in the file, I'll never forget this, is a memo where he says, well, you know, this is, again, in August. Um, it, it's really, you know, tragic that we're not able to get a, uh, I'm not getting the authority to get a warrant here, and they won't let me go to the criminal people to get a criminal search warrant, because someday there's going to be a plane crashing into the World Trade Center, and we're going to ask ourselves why we didn't investigate this. And I remember I <clears throat> went and I saw the AG, I and Larry, and, and Bob, I said, boy, the, you know, guys, you better sit down because the crap's really going to hit the fan. I didn't use the word crap. I think I used a stronger <laughs> word. And I explained what I had found. It was kind of, uh, of, of chilling. And that, I think, was a real illustration of, of what went on. I, I think the point I'd like to make is this. I mean, I, I echo everything Larry said. Um, but hindsight is perfect. You know, you can go back in history and, and revisit anything. When you live with the responsibility of making um, real-time decisions where a mistake results in the loss of life, um, that is a very different experience. Now, that's not to say you can't go back and look at decisions that were made and say, you know, 
maybe we shouldn't have done this or we should do it differently. And it's certainly worthwhile learning lessons and preparing for things based on experience. <clears throat> but I would not judge harshly people who motivated by a desire to prevent uh, catastrophic attacks <clears throat> use the legal tools that are available in good faith as best as they can, but really go really up to the line. Um, because what you don't want to have your people do, whether they're in the battlefield or they're in the intelligence community or law enforcement, is to be so worried about their own personal um, legal situation that they become risk averse. And unfortunately, the consequences of that fall on the innocent people who wind up getting killed. So, you know, as you think about these issues, I would think about in real time what it is like to have the responsibility to prevent people from being a subject of another attack. As I know, Larry members, there was a point a couple of days after the attack that John Ashcroft came back from a meeting with the president and, um, you know, assembled the senior folks together and said, uh, the president said to me, and I'm passing this on to you, John, don't let this happen again. And that was very much what was present in all of our minds uh, during my years of service at the Department of Justice and during my years of service as the Secretary of Homeland Security. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the term risk averse, Mike just used, of course, is uh, part of the post-9-11 lexicon we live with uh, these days. Uh, and we all remember, of course, that the, the, the investigating commissions and committees in the aftermath of 9-11, not to mention the media, uh, accused, uh, accused the intelligence community in particular of having been so risk averse in the years before 9-11 that we failed to uh, deter and prevent the attacks. So that, that charge was ringing in all of our, all of our years in those first days. Um, next uh, is Jim Haynes. Jim? <clears throat> Thank you. Like uh, the other members on this panel, I feel extremely uh, privileged to have served our country at, at a critical time, um, to s have served with these gentlemen and other people, uh, served under President Bush and um, to have seen, seen the decisions made in the time that we had to make them and feel very confident that what we did was motivated by all the right things and that we did what we think was necessary to protect the country. Um, I had one of the great jobs in government and frankly one of the great jobs for a lawyer. I was working for a global institution, the Defense Department, that had a storied history, had an undeniably good mission, which is to protect the country and protect the national security interests of the United States around the world, to serve with great people, with an institution that worked well for the most part, and it had great people who volunteered to serve, young men and women that are, I believe now, the greatest generation. Uh, people that President Bush talked about when he when he opened up, who came to the call of the guns uh, after 9-11 and continue to serve around the world today. And I salute them every day. Um, I took my job and I was confirmed in May of 2001 and Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld was there as a retread. He was Secretary of Defense 25 years earlier. And he had been asked by President Bush to come in and transform the department. The mission we had was essentially a turnaround operation. After the years of the previous administration and frankly the change in the world that was precipitated uh, by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the first Gulf War was still unfolding. And the Defense Department that we inherited in 2001 was still geared up to, to fight a Cold War with a, with a single adversary. And Secretary Rumsfeld came in prescient as he is in many things, uh, worried about asymmetrical threats and worried that the institution was, was ossified. And so uh, I came in expecting to work on things like uh, the defense industrial base and personnel matters and uh, reassertion of civilian control of the military and reordering some of our uh, alliances around the world in the defense area. And so on the morning of 9-11, I was early, as Secretary Rumsfeld 
being a workaholic, was in at 6.30 every morning. I was there at 6. Looking at the front page of the Washington Post about a speech he had given yesterday, the day before, 9.10, uh, to the bureaucracy in the Pentagon about how he was going to change things. And the title, uh, one of the subtitles was Rumsfeld's War on Bureaucracy. And it was this, what he called uh, uh, akin to reorganizing the sprockets of a, of a locomotive while it's rolling down the tracks at 60 miles an hour. Well, in between our first staff meeting, which did not include Secretary Rumsfeld because he was having breakfast with some members of Congress, uh, <coughs> and uh, me going back to my office, the first plane hit the first tower. And so we uh, charged our crisis action team and uh, began to uh, put into place a, a system that we had just put into place where the civilians were going to be back in the mix along with the joint staff and how to, how to address contingencies. And we didn't think this was anything akin to a terrorist attack. We just were thinking that this was going to be another possible situation where the military might be called under certain circumstances to assist civil authorities. And before we could gather, the second tower was hit. So I went down to the National Military Command Center, which has been portrayed in many different ways in movies over the years. And in fact, it's been redone two or three times since 9-11. But it, it's a very futuristic setting. It's uh, sort of deep in the bowels of the Pentagon. And it's, it's where all the information comes in from around the world. It's how the command and control for our military is, is channeled from everywhere and from every service into the Joint Staff and then up to the Secretary of Defense. And there was a small conference room that a few of us were gathered in to, to uh, get our crisis action system up and running. And then our plane hit our building. Now, I was about as far away as you could be from the crash site. Um, I was on what's called the river entrance side, and the, the plane hit our building, um, ironically, in the best possible place. Obviously not for the nearly 200 people who died that day, but it was the face of the building that was just completed its renovation, the first renovation of the Pentagon since ground was broken on September 11th, 1941 um, for the Pentagon. So the contractor had just turned over the keys to what we called the wedge, that side, that one-fifth of the Pentagon that had been renovated, and people were just moving in that morning. And so there were fewer people there that day than normally would have been. And the systems that were introduced into that part of the Pentagon were much more updated. So the sprinkler systems and the reinforced windows and, and ingress and egress uh, lighting was, was helpful in evacuating people. But uh, that's where the plane hit. And it was, as I've described to other people, it was something like the part of the Wizard of Oz where the movie changed from black and white to color uh, except, in my mind, it was like time w went from normal time to fast forward, and the rest of the day was just a blur. Uh, I didn't leave the Pentagon that entire day. Um, most of it was evacuated, but we were in the NMCC, National Military Command Center, and basically spent the day. Um, in one case, we had to move because the smoke got so bad. We had to move to a different location, but spent the day um, essentially dealing with people, some of the people on this table, in a secure video teleconference connection with various nodes of government uh, around the country for the most part. And instead of dealing with restructuring a bureaucracy <coughs> and moving boxes and economizing and so forth, uh, uh, advising on those kinds of things, all of a sudden we were dealing with rules of engagement, and whether we could or should shoot down civilian aircraft. As Mike described, there was a, there was a flight from Korea that, that day that was squawking 7,500 on the, 
on the box, on the black box. It was the hijack signal. And we scrambled jets to um, escort the plane. Uh, Norty Schwartz, who was the two-star Air Force commander in Alaska, uh, was seeking authority to, uh, or what his, what his authority was to do something about it. Uh, Norty later became chief of staff of the Air Force. Um, Secretary of Defense and Dick, Dick Myers, who was then the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, were uh, with, to, I was with them, I should say, um, uh, periodically in contact with the president, who was, who was moving uh, <clears throat> mostly in Air Force One, first to Barksdale Air Force Base, then to Offutt, and then Offutt Air Force Base, and then back again, about uh, whether, in fact, uh, there should be authority to do, to do that. Um, there was actually another incident that, um, that I recall uh, earlier, a little bit later that, later that day, uh, of, a, of a U.S. air flight coming in from Madrid, where we had a similar uh, concern. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that you learn in crisis response is first reports are almost always wrong, and uh, those, were, those were two, but nevertheless, we had to be ready because we had... Uh, as we all know, an amazing uh, and, and horrible circumstance to deal with. So, so those were the kinds of things that all of a sudden I had to deal with as, as a lawyer. And it didn't, it didn't end there by any means, as you might imagine. Um, there were other, other threats that Mike has alluded to. We, I, I recall there were some concerns about some unidentified suspicious people on a train. Um, we, we set up uh, the, the, the crisis action team that I was talking about that, that basically <clears throat> operated uh, nonstop for the next few years <coughs> where we would platoon people in and, and work around the clock, uh, including lawyers, uh, to deal with things. But that night when I was, uh, before I left uh, the Pentagon, uh, I was up with, uh, with that team and we were thinking, okay, what if there are other people out there? Um, the Secretary of Transportation grounded all the, all the planes on that day, but who knows what other planes might have been destined for other buildings. Um, what happened, in fact, from, from my standpoint, I was wondering at that point, what happened to that plane that was coming in from, from Korea? It turned, I didn't learn until the next day that it actually set down in, in Canada. It overflew Alaska, which gave us significant concerns because we started plotting how far into the country could it fly before, before it ran out of fuel? Uh, so we were thinking about what if there are commandos on the grounds of the Capitol? And as the general counsel of the Defense Department, among the things I needed to worry about were what were the laws applicable to the, to the deployment of the military forces in the continental United States? There is a statute called the Posse Comitatus Act, which, which prohibits the application of military members, mostly uh, the Navy is excluded, but uh, Army and Air Force from law enforcement purposes. Well, there we had, uh, in an immediate way, the contrast between the law of war and uh, the enforcement of the civil laws of the country. So that was the, just the beginning of things that led over the next few months uh, into uh, questions about how do you evaluate the people who have been attacked who have attacked our country. Should they be treated as criminals? Should they be treated as if we catch them prisoners of war? Or should they be treated as what we ultimately determined uh, based on precedent and legal analysis and good policy? Unlawful enemy combatants who fall into another category. Um, we set up at the President's direction military commissions to give the country an alternative not a, not a substitute, but an alternative available to the country to try terrorists if, if and when we caught them. Uh, we had to deal with uh, data collection. It turned out to be uh, one of the principal, most, most valuable objectives in this war it turned out to be not capturing territory or seeking surrender of, of capitals, <clears throat> but rather collecting information in advance so that we could protect the country. So there are any number of things that we could get into, and, and, and Larry's allusion to, to the wall and to the, to the need for cooperation 
is uh, exactly what we did as a legal team across the government and, um, and, and went on from there. So what do I, what do I have uh, to reflect upon? Um, we'll, we'll have a little while to, to revisit that, but one of the things that I think is that we were, we were lawyers and we were officers of the United States. We had constitutional responsibilities um, beyond our role as l lawyers for clients. And what we tried to do, and I think we each would say that we're comfortable with, with, with the decisions that we made, almost without exception, is that we, as advisors, we helped the president develop options that were lawful, that were consistent with his desire to protect the country, uh, that were rooted in the Constitution, in the law, and in tradition, and that provided the, the president with all the, national, the tools of national power that he needed to deal with, with a very uncertain situation. So flexibility was key. The ability to adapt to the unforeseen, um, and we can talk about more of that later. I think that's probably enough for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, our next panelist, um, <clears throat> Judge Mukasey, of course, was not serving in the uh, executive branch uh, on 9-11, but nonetheless uh, was in and would prove to be in a key uh, position um, on that day. Uh, Judge? Well, um, on the, the, the morning of 9-11 actually was my, my second you know, introduction to the war on terror, the first time they come in. Um, 1993 with what is now referred to as the first World Trade Center bombing and we had a, a trial in New York involving the blind shake and a bunch of other people and it became clear that this was all very much on their agenda. They wanted to, they wanted to come back and do it again. Um, that was supposed to be a wake-up call as it happened. It was principally the occasion for hitting the snooze button. Um, <laughs> largely, I mean, for a variety of reasons including the fact that virtually to the day there was, uh, there was a, another trial going on on the West Coast uh, called People of the State of California versus Orenthal James Simpson that seemed to absorb um, all, of the, all of the nervous energy and, and, and focus on, on legal issues. But on the morning of 9-11, of as it happens, as a result of that trial, I had a, a detail of marshals, and I was in a doctor's office that morning uh, coming out of the haze, and um, my wife and daughter showed up, I thought, to provide moral support. Um, <laughs> prevent me from fainting, and uh, they told me what happened, and I asked the, the head of the detail, um, is this our guys? And he said yes, um, and so we got up. Um, I got in touch with um, the courthouse, uh, found that people were starting to evacuate. Uh, by then, both planes had hit. Um, found that one of my colleagues was still um, proceeding with a trial, and um, I asked the marshal um, to go in and bring that to um, a polite end if possible, but an end in any event. Um, <laughs> so we got that stopped, um, got everybody out of the building. Um, miraculously, and not miraculously, but it shows you what career people are like. One of the building engineers, before everybody got out of the building, thought to turn off um, the air intake, um, which if it had stayed on, it would have made that building uninhabitable for months. Uh, this guy just decided, to turn the valves before everybody left, and as a result, we were able eventually to get back in the building. That day, however, um, I eventually made contact with the U.S. Attorney, and uh, the next couple of days were taken up with um, my preparing, uh, uh, her preparing, actually, and, and, and my signing uh, warrants, uh, as well as kind of routine orders, extending everybody's time in civil cases, um, extending time under the Speedy Trial Act, lest we get somebody claiming that uh, they should be released as a result of <coughs> the inability of the court to deal with them. Um, and also <coughs> persuading um, my fellow judges, because you know the word went out that nobody who was not in an essential position should be going downtown, uh, persuading federal judges they are not in an essential position. Um, <laughs> When they, you know, they see themselves as sort of, you know, little little Churchills planting planting uh, Union Jacks in the rubble. Um, uh, it, it was a it was a delicate thing, but we finally got them persuaded that they 
could not go down to the building. Um, the, the U.S. Attorney, um, we had, we prepared search warrants um, as well as to take people into custody, material witness warrants, and the way that worked, uh, it would usually shake down in one of three ways. Either um, somebody would be taken into custody, they would disclose what they knew, and they would join Team America, or they would um, be put in front of a grand jury, um, lie, and then be indicted for perjury. Uh, or it might be found that nothing, they really knew nothing, and it would all been a big mistake, in which case they'd be released. Um, material witness warrant actually allows the government to take somebody into custody when they are a, th a threat not to appear when they're needed. That's what allowed them to do that. It is not a, uh, a preventive custody statute, and um, we eventually had one case involving a man named Jose Padilla. Uh, he pronounced it Padilla, by the way, rhymes with gorilla, uh, rather than Padilla. And um, he wasn't interested in cooperating, um, and the government kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, and I told them at one point that they would have to, the following Tuesday, either fish or cut bait, which is to say either indict him or, or put him in a grand jury or do something, uh, but I couldn't continue him in custody indefinitely. Um, and that weekend I got a visit from the then U.S. attorney um, telling me that the president had decided that he would be treated as an unlawful combatant, taken into military custody, and of course um, the rest of that is, is, is history. Um, the um, um, the, 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 the cases um, that developed uh, afterward were largely um, were prosecuted, I think, principally in the Eastern District of Virginia. Um, when, um, um, when I was, uh, ne the next real focus that I had in, in, in relation to intelligence gathering came during my um, uh, confirmation proceedings when the, the interrogation techniques became the focus of a lot of inquiry, and I think that's something <coughs> I'm going to talk about um, eventually. So why don't I just yield the floor back to okay. back to our Thank moderator. You, Judge. Uh, well, for my part, I was uh, <coughs> on the morning of 9/11. I was uh, sitting in my office. I typically would have the TV on. Uh, there was always a, a chance um, something would come up about CIA in the daily coverage uh, I'd learned over the years. So I just kept. I would keep the sound down low, and then of course. Uh, uh, I saw what everyone else uh, saw immediately inside the building. Uh, I can tell you, I mean, it's impossible to describe in retrospect a collective feeling of uh, shame, anger, guilt that we as an organization has failed uh, to uncover the, uh, the plot in time. Uh, my office was on the, uh, was on the uh, top floor, uh, floor ceiling windows that see it in Langley, seventh floor. And of course, as, it, as the morning unfolded uh, in that surreal, uh, horrifying way, the, the third plane, the one that eventually went down in uh, Shanksville, at that point, you recall, uh, there was uh, speculation, fevered speculation, uh, among all the other fevered speculation that Mike, Mike Chertoff alluded to, that, that this plane could be bound for the Capitol, for the White House, or for the CIA, or towards the CIA. As a result, there was an evacuation order given uh, for all but those directly involved in counterterrorism operations. I looked out my window, saw hundreds of people uh, walking to their cars in the vast CIA parking lot, uh, most walking, some running, and uh, those of you who have been to Langley know there were only a couple of exits out of there. Uh, it soon became total gridlock on the campus. I looked out and uh, sagely concluded that I wasn't going to be able to get home for hours, so uh, trying to ignore the increasingly uh, loud uh, alarms in the, uh, in the hallway, I closed my door, figured I had no place else to go, so I started to think and, and jot down uh, uh, because I knew uh, that, C that in the wake of this catastrophe, uh, CIA would be asked, ordered, demanded to undertake uh, activities of a kind we had never uh, undertaken before. I had sort of an inchoate no notion of that. And so I started um, 
and on, on that most unimaginable of days, I let my imagination run wild. And uh, being a good lawyer, I pulled out a yellow legal pad and started scribbling just really phrases, words. Among those words uh, were captured, detain, and uh, interrogate. Um, keep in mind that, that I would not learn of the word waterboarding until a few months later. So this was, as I say, this was uh, very uh, general. But even that, capturing, detaining, interrogating is something CIA had never done in my career. Uh, I, had no, I had no way of understanding how we would do it, but I knew that we would, we, this is something we, we needed to do uh, in the wake of 9-11. Of course, there were, I took my um, scribbled down lethal operations. At that point, the, the drone program, such as it was, was more theoretical than real. Uh, uh, drones had not, the technology had not arrived at 9-11 to make them uh, weaponized. Uh, but I understood that we couldn't kill everybody and that we, as an intelligence organization, of course, we, institutional DNA is, is to collect intelligence and you can't collect intelligence from dead people, dead terrorists. So that's how I, that's why uh, I scribbled down those words. And of course, uh, six days later, uh, th those initial scribbles after frantic round-the-clock uh, uh, meetings at the White House that uh, folks on this panel uh, attended, there came from the Oval Office, from President Bush, a what we called a presidential finding, memorandum of notification, a covert action directive. Uh, I'd written hundreds of those in my career, but none like this. And that is really, uh, that is really um, how, it, uh, how it began for me. Uh, as I say, the uh, enhanced interrogation program did not come together as an idea for uh, about three months uh, after that. Um, I'm looking, I'm trying to be mindful of the clock here. I think I will leave my, my, uh, you know, my opening blurb uh, at that uh, because I do want to, you know, this is such a vast subject as we were getting together, trying to pick what substantive areas to concentrate on was impossible. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, my colleagues here have already touched on several of them, so with their indulgence, I just want to, uh, let me just j jump ahead quickly. Um, Judge McKay, you had you alluded to the um, the uh, charming Mr. Uh, Padilla and your role in uh, what was really a, a seminal case early on uh, uh, in the 9/11 era as the notion of uh, of prosecuting, bringing it to justice, uh, not just the 9/11 plotters, uh, but other Al Qaeda uh, sympathizers uh, in those in those uh, frantic, uh, desperate. Uh, early months. Uh, first of all, do you want to? I want to give you the opportunity, to, if, you, if you choose to, to expand on the Padilla case. Uh, yeah, the, he, um, as I said, he was in, he was in custody on a material witness warrant, and um, the um, the government, when they took him into military custody, um, even the government conceded that he had the right to file a habeas petition. Um, and what I found was that. Um, if he had the right to file a habeas petition, then under the All Writs Act, um, in aid of jurisdiction uh, over the habeas petition, I could, um, I had the right, essentially, um, to have a lawyer prepare the papers rather than have him prepare them. Um, and so I directed that there be a lawyer appointed solely for the purpose of having him prepare a habeas petition and not for any other purpose. In other words, it would have been fine, thank you, uh, to have continued to interrogate him in any way, fashion, whatever. Uh, so long as a lawyer could consult with him, prepare the habeas petition, and file it, and uh, found also that the president had authority, um, have him taken into custody in that fashion. The case finally went up to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court found that I didn't have jurisdiction over Mr. Padilla because he had been moved, um, and so the entire matter shifted to, um, to the Fourth Circuit. I still kind of wish that uh, the government hadn't moved him um, because I think yeah. you know, it might have come out better. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think so too. <laughs> well, I, actually, well, I have Mr. Chertoff here next to me. Why did the government move him, Michael? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't you tell him who he was? 
Yeah, Padilla, if I remember correctly, was, um, I forget how, uh, maybe Jim remembers, I remember, forget how we got on to him, but he ultimately was somebody who had been, uh, of course, the name Padilla suggests he was not, uh, you know, uh, born uh, a Muslim or didn't come from the region, but he had converted at some point. I forget what his new name was. But he had been in touch with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed at some point and was involved in uh, some potential plotting that we discovered, you know, from an intelligence uh, source. So he was viewed as a combatant, even though, if I recall correctly, he was picked up at the airport in the United States. And the, you know, generally, if you're picking people up here in the U.S., it's going to be law enforcement people who have that first encounter. Uh, but there was always some debate about to what extent do you do you uh, you know treat an American citizen. Um, in the military channel or in the uh, civilian channel. Now, if I recall correctly, on the military commissions, they were not applicable to a U.S. citizen. But that doesn't mean you can't detain somebody as a, uh, under the laws of war without getting into a trial, even if they're U.S. citizens. And, you know, there have been past wars in which there have been some Americans who fought with the enemy, and they are treated like, like an enemy. So I think in this case, what happened was a... a um, a sense that it was appropriate to detain him and that it might not have been um, possible without compromising some, some very classified stuff to have the process run entirely in the, um, in the law enforcement domain. By way of contrast, when we had the shoe bomber, um, Richard Reed, he was picked up, obviously, in Boston. The shoes did not detonate, but he had tried to blow up a, a plane. Um, and he actually was processed through um, uh, civilian channels. I mean, he was, uh, you know, he was caught red-handed. He was ultimately convicted and, and uh, sent away, although there was some debate at the time, if I recall, about whether he should have been put into, into a military channel, but it, it was just, you know, pretty straightforward to treat him as a, as a law enforcement matter. Uh, Larry, do you have anything you want to add from your perspective as DAG at the time on these, on these deliberations? If um, you, uh, there were lots of conflicting policy decisions, and so I was sort of a referee, I guess, to some yeah. of these things. But I, I want to just point out what Mike said. When you're making these decisions, uh, the one thing that uh, at least I know I did and other top people in, the, in, in government, not just the Department of Justice, the bottom line is, what do we do to try to protect <coughs> our citizens? That was the basis, not some kind of this agency versus that agency. Uh, the president's mandate was very clear. We, should, we are not going to let this happen again. And, what, and we acted upon decisions that we thought would most effectively and efficiently protect ourselves. Let me add one thing. I mean, if you think about <coughs> prior to 9-11, for the preceding 100 years, we had in our mind a very fixed construct of the difference between war and, and law enforcement. War was an away game, and law enforcement was a home game. And with the exception of the Nazi saboteurs who came ashore in World War II, really all of our military conflicts, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, were all far away from the United States. It, was, it seemed obvious that you could have kind of a binary view of the law. Um, I think what 9-11 raised was uh, the fact that that, that division blurred, and that we became a field of combat in the U.S. because terrorists were going to carry out acts over here. And also, the citizenship issue did not necessarily um, align neatly with whether you're dealing with an enemy or a friend. This problem, by the way, continues as we deal with cyber uh, issues, because cyber attacks, even if they're launched by a foreign power, uh, often can originate or transit through American uh, infrastructure, and Americans can be involved in it. And so th this issue of how do you uh, reconfigure the legal architecture to deal with a much more amorphous distinction between what is typically military and what's typically law enforcement, this kind of persists as an interesting and challenging legal uh, topic. Mike, I think in uh, the cyber area, it's even been exacerbated because people are, again, making these hard, abstract, theoretical decisions based upon principles uh, that bear no reality to how we can protect ourselves and what we need to do and what kind of tools do we need to give uh, government professionals who are on the front line. So, but that being said, we, we, 
did and do have precedent yeah. to draw from. Uh, you're right, Mike, for 100 years before, there was this neatness to our wars, if you will. But what we found ourselves doing was going back to Lincoln, where we had a civil war, and we didn't have a, a declared war. And the president at that time had to wrestle with a lot of the questions that we found ourselves wrestling with then. Um, you know, the conduct against, the, uh, against the, the civil laws within the boundaries of the country. And, um, you know, I said something early on about what we were trying to do as lawyers, among <coughs> other things, was to, to draw on well-established constitutional tools that might not have been used in recent times, but were validated in some cases by the Supreme Court of the United States in the past. For example, the Quirin case, the Nazi saboteurs, uh, happened in 1942 when uh, Franklin Roosevelt established a military commission uh, for the first time in the country um, since the Civil War. There had been some examples of military commissions in, in combats over, overseas before then, but, but he, <coughs> talk about efficient. Um, the, the saboteurs were captured in <coughs> June of 42, as I recall. Uh, the president established a military commission of seven major generals, two-star generals, to try the case. Um, the case was tried. Uh, Frank Royal, who was the chief defense counsel, a military uh, judge advocate colonel, who later became the first secretary of the army, uh, represented the, the defendants, uh, asked the president for permission to seek uh, cert, or seek, seek uh, permission to, to uh, seek uh, habeas review by the Supreme Court. The president studiously, President Roosevelt studiously was silent about that. Uh, got to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard the case, decided that the president had that authority, and among the, the defendants was at least one American, uh, allowed the conviction to stand, and before the decision was written, the executions were carried out. So uh, this was something that was validated by the Supreme Court of the it United was, States. It was, it was three months from the landing um, to the executions. Um, so the, it worked. Um, it worked pretty efficiently, and uh, <laughs> um, the uh, the president is reputed to have told the, the attorney general at the time, um, "I don't want one. Of your, I don't want one of your marshals um, serving some kind of writ um, uh, in this case because he'll wind up in custody along with um, the defendants." <laughs> but but our uh, you know this this. This point about dealing with American citizens, I mean, we, you know, who would have thunk, right? Who would have, who would have thought that we'd get attacked like this? I remember watching those towers fall in the NMCC uh, and thinking that this was worse than Antietam, which was the bloodiest day in American history. Um, because surely there would have been tens of thousands of people who would have died in those towers. And fortunately, the planes hit early in the day. New York didn't start as early as Washington, and there weren't as many people in the buildings. We had the enormous numbers of heroic acts uh, by the firefighters and police and, and citizens in, in New York, um, but it wasn't fortunately as bad, but it was still bad. It was worse than Pearl Harbor in terms of the loss of life. And so who would have thought of that? But also who would have thought that Americans would be involved? And Mike and I dealt with uh, John Walker Lind, who, when we went into Afghanistan on October 7th, which is a whole other story, I mean, there was a lot of legal issues associated with any time you send, send our men and women into war. Uh, you know, we, we sought and got an authorization for use of military force from the Congress. As, as John has alluded or uh, mentioned, we had the memorandum of notification to deal with covert actions. Um, uh, we went into Afghanistan, and I remember getting a call from Tommy Franks. They caught a, an American citizen uh, in, the, uh, in the prison uprising uh, in Masri Sharif. And so we had to deal with that. And then we discovered one of the people that we had captured uh, in Afghanistan had, in fact, been born in Louisiana 
a guy named Hamdi. And we had him in Guantanamo. And one of the first things I said was, we got to get him out of there because <laughs> there may be some jurisdictional reach for an American citizen in Guantanamo. And we, we had chosen that location for a number of reasons, including uh, um, what we expected uh, uh, we would be able to, to do through the commander in chief's authorities. Um, and then, of course, Mr. Padilla. I'm reminded of the correct pronunciation. Um, but in each case, we brought them back. We brought them from Guantanamo. We brought them from Afghanistan. In the case of Mr. Padilla, who, who was captured in Chicago. Chicago, but it was a port of entry because he, had, he was coming in from overseas. Uh, and he ended up in Judge Mukasey's jurisdiction because of the material witness warrant. And they brought him, and as I recall, we put him, we, we, he was being detained, uh, I think he was being detained in a military facility. In, no, he was, he was initially was at the, um, the military, uh, at the, uh, the MCC, the, right. the Metropolitan Correctional Center. Did we move him to Governor's Island at some point? Um, no, I think he have. was, he, yeah. the first time he got moved was, was, to, uh, was to the brig at Charleston. Yeah, I, I remember the mechanics of that. I think we actually <laughs> sent a plane up to uh, West Point to yeah. pick yeah. him up and yeah. bring him down to Charleston. But, you know, we were making a lot of these decisions on the fly because who would have thought? And, um, you know, we, we brought, we brought uh, Mr. Hamdy up to uh, the brig in Norfolk, Virginia, I believe, and we brought Mr. Padilla down to uh, Charleston Brig. Let me... Uh Pivot quickly because I'm, I'm being a good moderator. I'm looking at the uh, at the clock. You know, there, as I indicated, there's so many areas we could have gotten into, and uh, just just not but not possible to deal with them. There's one there's one subject matter I want to briefly touch before we open it up to questions. And uh, let me start with with Judge uh, Mukasey on this because he uh, you know, he was confirmed as Attorney General. Uh, Five years after 9/11, uh, and by that time, the, the the controversy, specifically over the interrogation program, was reaching a fever pitch, a, a vitriolic, and I will, I can tell you from experience, toxic pitch. And so Judge Mukasey walks in as Attorney General uh, at the most uh, difficult time, uh, really, in the, in my view, the post 9/11 uh, era. You know, he inherited. He walked into a to a controversy, um, two controversies caused caused by my agency. If you recall the the tapes destruction. I certainly do. Um, and also, he was uh, he was confronted with with uh, extraordinary, really, uh, an internal investigation by the Justice Department, Office of Professional Responsibility, into the actions the decisions that Justice Department lawyers had made uh, in the post 9-11 era, you know, particularly the, uh, the, uh, the memos uh, from the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, a number of them over the years, uh, uh, opining on the, uh, on the interrogation program. So I'd just, just like you to touch on that if you could for a second. Uh, yeah, when I, when I got there, the, um, the Office of Professional Responsibility, which is an institution unique um, to the Justice Department. I mean, everybody's got um, an IG um, who serves supposedly as part of the executive, but they report to Congress, and it's all very ambiguous. Um, there is an Office of Professional Responsibility because we mostly got lawyers at the Justice Department, and they said they were uh, investigating uh, the, uh, uh, the propriety of, of the opinions that had been rendered by the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, I mean, I have my own view about their um, competence um, to deal with um, a question like that. I mean, it's, 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 uh, um, it's kind of like having a proctologist pass on um, <laughs> what a brain surgeon has done. Um, <laughs> these, um, these people are, that's, that's not their job and they're not suited for it. In any event, um, we were told, we used to get periodic reports from the head of OPR, you know, where's the, where's the report on uh, uh, on actually John Yu and Jay Bybee, who were the principal focus of, of this in, uh, inquiry. And we kept being told, well, it's, it's, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's unremarkable. Um, and then on uh, December 23, 2008, which I will remember because it was, you know, it was two days before Christmas, everybody's packed up, there's a new administration going to be coming in. <clears throat> the head of OPR um, plunked a, uh, 
two hundred plus page report um, on my desk and said that uh, he recommended that both uh, Jay Bybee, who was then a circuit judge, and John Yu uh, be recommended for discipline to the to the uh, the bars to which uh, they were admitted to practice. <coughs> Um, that they had violated professional standards, that they had uh, rendered incompetent uh, and, and unjustified advice um, in the memos that came out of, out of the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, which, by the way, I had reviewed, um, as I promised I would for the, for the, um, uh, for the Judiciary Committee, uh, and found not at all incompetent. Um, and uh, he said that he wanted uh, my comments as I recall it, uh, by January 5, um, and he was planning to release it January 12. Um, sat down with uh, Mark Phillip, who was deputy AG and a splendid, splendid lawyer, um, and a group of others. Um, we drafted a, a, about a 13-page um, single-space response to, um, to that that included a direction um, that he not issue it um, unless and until um, he made good on the promise that he had made, which he apparently had no intention of keeping, uh, to let them review it before it was issued. Um, and uh, of course that, that stayed in place uh, after we left. Um, and uh, eventually the case was appealed up through the deputy's office and the finding that they were to be recommended for discipline uh, was turned around uh, by a career uh, DOJ person named David Margolis who I think um, should get the Medal of Freedom one of these years uh, for that, among other things. Among uh, other things. Right. Yeah. Uh, just a superb, superb guy. He's been there for what, 50 years plus? Uh, 50 years plus. Right. Um, and uh, is the, the, the institutional memory and conscious of the Justice Department. So if you ever get a chance, write David a thank you note. He'll be surprised. Um, he, may, he may respond with a profanity, but that's just his way. <laughs> As I say, it was, I mean, in retrospect, it's just, extraordinary and, uh, and it was an act of uh, extraordinary integrity encouraged by Judge McKay in taking the action he did. Um, okay, we were, we're coming down, uh, the time is coming down. I want to give everyone in the panel an opportunity to, uh, by way of wrapping up before the, the Q&A, uh, like Chair Tuff has already talked about some of the, some of the lessons learned. Uh, so I would like to ask you briefly to, to, from a perspective now of 14 years later, uh, lessons learned uh, upon reflection, uh, any things you, in retrospect you should have or actions you took that you should have taken or vice versa. Uh, <coughs> Larry Thompson? Well, lessons learned is, is that you cannot be so risk averse that you don't do the job of protecting um, our citizens. Um, a mistake that we made, uh, there was a big howl because we learned that some of the uh, people who were in prison or in jail were using their lawyers to pass messages back to other terrorists uh, through operating through the um, arcane uh, regulatory world of the Bureau of Prisons. We instituted a, a rule, a regulation that basically allowed um, us, the government officials, to designate certain people, and we would tell their lawyers when you go in to uh, talk to your client, um, it's going to be recorded. And there was obviously a huge howl from the bar, the defense bar. Well, as it turned out, Judge McKay mentioned the blind sheik. As it turned out, uh, this was exactly what was happening, and um, his lawyer was carrying messages out of prison back to other terrorists as to what he was directing them to do. So maybe we shouldn't have uh, instituted that uh, rule or regulation, but it was something that we thought was necessary. And I'm glad we did. Thanks, Larry. <coughs> Mike Chertoff? <clears throat> yeah, as a footnote, I think we convicted her. That's Lynn Stewart was convicted exactly. of having, yeah. of having uh, been involved. I think she's still in jail. <laughs> no, she actually, she got um, humane release because she claimed to be um, dying of cancer. Yes, yeah. um, she has failed to make good on her part of the deal.
Yeah, that reminds me of the guy who, the, the guy they released from a Scottish prison who was supposed to be dying from cancer, McGrabi, and was over in Libya, I think, for years. I think he died in the, in the latest conflict. Um, I would just say this. I mean, obviously, when we were dealing in the immediate post-9-11 <clears throat> environment, uh, whether it was the issue of detaining people and using material witness warrants, uh, or some of the issues around uh, the authorities to collect communications, uh, you know, you're dealing with laws that were not adapted to some of the conditions that we were dealing with, and you're trying to apply them as best as you can. I do think w the lesson I would take is, though, there needs to be, just as in the military and in, and in Homeland Security, there is a lot of forward planning for contingencies and even exercising and training about what would we do in the following situation so people know they have at least a playbook to begin uh, executing an operation. I think lawyers need to do that, too. I think the, that the, the Department of Justice needs to think about what conflict or what kinds of issues might arise in the next 10 years and begin to either uh, develop a, a, a plan about how to use the existing legal authorities or perhaps to say, you know what, we need different authorities or new authorities and to go back and, and get those in advance. That was done on a kind of a rolling basis in the wake of 9-11, but um, as you discover more and more in the modern world, time is your enemy, and um, therefore, the, to the extent you can anticipate issues, you do yourself a, a real service. Jim Haynes. Boy, it's too early to say what I learned. I, you know, <laughs> I, I left office in 2008 and try to put all this behind me, not, notwithstanding some people who are coming after me. Um, and this has been a great opportunity to, to get my head back into it. I will say that uh, as uh, one lesson is, is an increased admiration for our constitutional system, our, our U.S. Constitution and, and the organs that it has created. Um, the sort of conservative in me uh, admires the structure of that document uh, and it's, it's, it's the premium it puts on, on separation of powers and federalism, and I use that in a sense of, 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 of a laboratory where you allow legal authorities within their own spheres to, to develop tools that are, that are appropriate in their eyes and then let it come back together in a, in, in a system where you have checks and balances and adversarial um, opportunities to, to really flesh out problems that are profound. Uh, this, is, this war on terror is, notwithstanding our best wishes, not behind us. Uh, it is a very dangerous world. The tools that the terrorists can use or state actors are really deadly, and we need to be nimble and, and as Mike says, thinking ahead and, and, and using the authorities that exist uh, and thinking about how to, how to anticipate those kinds of things. And I, I just think that the, the role of lawyers is, uh, is critical to that. Good. Judge? Um, I think one of the things that has persisted, unfortunately, is um, what Jack Goldsmith uh, called cycles of, of timidity and aggression in the intelligence community, and that, I think, is a real tragedy and we're still going through it. I mean, it's, it starts out with, you all remember after 9-11, there, there were people hollering about the failure to connect the dots, right? Um, and uh, now we're in the business of, of making sure that there are, you can't gather dots so that yeah. there won't be any claim that you didn't connect them. Um, we need to get away from that um, because it, it's, we've gone through cycles in the 60s and the 80s and the 90s uh, where there were, where the, the intelligence community is criticized first for being overly timid then they go out on a limb. Um, the political branches fail to back them up. They retreat back and forth and back and forth. Um, that damages damages careers, damages lives, damages the morale at those um, at the CIA and at the NSA and, and elsewhere. And um, if we're going to keep going, we got to really got to get away from that because we're going through it now. All right. No, I agree. I'm going to yield back the balance of my time, other than briefly say. Uh, one regret I have is that we didn't uh, brief more members of Congress at the beginning of the interrogation program. We briefed only eight, and uh, we should have known, I should have known that the 
briefing eight members of Congress guarantees you that at least four will lie about their knowledge years later when the political winds turn. So, uh, on behalf of the entire panel, unless someone wants to do uh, any, any closing remarks, I just want to uh, express our appreciation for your attention, and uh, we hope and trust you've gotten uh, something uh, out of this session. Anyway, thank you very much.